So when we think about this natural state being euphoria, our natural state being consciousness and bliss, our natural state being ever free, ever pure, ever wise, then doesn't it behoove us in anything that is troubling us from the outside that we turn within to find the solution or the answer to the disorienting dilemma we're experiencing? Welcome to Letting Go and the Greatest Secret, where we explore the end of your suffering and the beginning of lasting happiness. I'm Hale Dwoskin, and today we'll be talking with Dr. Paul R. Shioui, who is co-founder of one of my favorite companies to help everyone, including you, experience and live your full potential, learning strategies. Paul Shioui created the photo reading Whole Mind System, his photo reading book has sold around 2 million copies, which is superb. He has created personal learning courses such as Genius Code, Natural Brilliance, and Future Mappy. And Paul created an amazing series of programs to help you access the resources of your inner mind. They are called Paraliminals. And I'm so pleased to have co-created a Paraliminal with Paul called Letting Go. So let's start by just, I know you've taken a look at the book, The Greatest Secret. What is it that struck you most about Rhonda's new book, The Greatest Secret? Well, I loved how she's attempted to bring a fairly difficult and complex concept of who are you, really, if you're not your body and you're not your emotions and you're not your mind, who are you? And the fact that the perennial wisdom behind every great spiritual tradition points to the same spot right. uh, yeah, is, is an important thing to recognize. And for anyone who isn't aware that who you are is awareness, it is that presence and power before a thought arises, and that you had your birth somewhere long before this physical incarnation called the human experience took place, and will go on long after it. I mean, these are concepts that are thousands and thousands of years old and recognized by ancient traditions and written about and explained. And yet here in our modern world, it seems absolutely astounding. <laughs> right. <laughs> but the other piece about it that's so important is that there is an ongoing practice that can be a part of our daily lives to keep us connected to that awareness of who we are. That my teacher of yoga, I was trained in the Himalayan tradition called Raja Yoga. There are eight rungs to this yes. tradition and mantra meditation is one of those where you go into silence, you just be present moving beyond your identification with the thoughts or your identification with your personality or your history or anything else. And you really are in the place of just being. And one of the things that was said is if we could just take a few moments to drop into a place of silence throughout our day, every two and a half, three hours, let's say, whatever becomes the mind's practice becomes the mind's habit. Whatever you do repeatedly, he said, becomes the mind's habit. And if we have a habit of awfulizing our lives and panicking about every little thing <laughs> right. that could ah, happen. The yeah. sky is falling, the, the sky, sky is falling. <laughs> exactly, then that becomes the mind's habit. And many people who turn toward meditation for the first time, say, oh, I've tried to meditate. Oh, it, it doesn't work. You know, I close my eyes and it's just a mess in there. And well, of course, if you are awake 18 hours and for 17 hours and 40 minutes a day, 
<laughs> your mind is attached to everything that's going on. Guess what happens for the 20 minutes that you close your eyes to meditate? So much of what Rhonda is referring to is what many yogic traditions refer to as undoing, unlearning. And the work of teachings of Narsagadatta Maharaj, where he talks about Advaita Vedanta, where not this, not this, not this. She goes through practices like that that really help you undo the attachments to thoughts and feelings and the physical body and the ego and all of those things, which we're going to live with as long as we're in a human form, <laughs> we've got them and we right, need right, to right. learn how to have all that going on without it taking us away from the truth of who we are. And that really is at the essence of the book. It's the truth. Yes. Yes. And it, honestly, I, it feels like it's the essence of a lot of what both of us do in our work. We are either overtly helping people with this or surreptitiously helping people with this in some cases. In my experience, most of the work that you do and that I do is designed either to help people recognize this truth of that being awareness or presence that we all are, or to help us stop being distracted and attached or adverse to the contents of consciousness. And I like that. Yeah. The idea that it's really about managing our states and if state management is the other thing, other than being aware that we are awareness, then yeah, so much of our teachings are designed around facilitating both of those aspects of our existence. Yes, yes, yes. I was a big fan of personal development work back in the early 1970s. I had done some work as a meditator and hypnosis and self-hypnosis and mind control. And I did rebirthing, which was a very interesting. I didn't know you did that concept. too. I did that too. <laughs> yeah, I did two five-day rebirth trainings with the idea of becoming a rebirthing instructor. That's so funny. And it was I, so, I, before, so I, before I got into the Sedona method, one of the things I went through is being trained as a rebirther. Yeah. And the idea of theta seminars. Yes, and, yes. And that's something Jack Hanfield did also. No, I didn't you know, know Jack a, did it too. He was that's, a that's where I met Wester. Okay, good. Wester yeah. came as a guest. I organized a seminar for yeah. theta seminars. And Lester came as a guest of the seminar leader. And that's where I met him. And yes, that changed right. my entire life. I went, <laughs> oh, wow, this is, he's a living embodiment of truth. I need to find out more about this. And before I was even done, I did his uh, seminar, which someone else taught. Before I was even done with uh, that seminar, the two weekend seminar, I realized I was going to dedicate my life to that perspective of letting go. Isn't and it all started with that thing that you, me, and Jack share. I didn't even realize that before. <laughs> yeah. And Leonard Orr was so remarkable because it's you take a breath and then let it go. <laughs> That's mm. really all rebirthing is, right? Yes, and the letting go. He emphasized the letting go part of breathing. That's right. Yes. And Diane that. Hinterman, who led the rebirth trainings that I took, tried to track down the immortal master of India known as Harakan Baba. Right, and right, uh, right. he had apparently manifest a physical incarnation, 26, 27 year old body in Harakan, India. And she had heard that he was living there. And the reason she was intrigued is while she was rebirthing someone, which in case you don't know what this is as a listener to this program, basically lay down and breathe. And it's, right. you go right. into something like a hyperventilation syndrome, but it's a, it's a remarkable experience, holotropic breathing, breath awareness. There's a that lot of different forms that, yeah. of it these days. But while she was rebirthing this woman, a small yogi ascetic suddenly appeared next to the body of the woman she was rebirthing <laughs> and hung out there for five, 10 minutes and then disappeared. And when Diane was done with the rebirth of this woman, she said, you know, while we were doing this, some little bearded guy showed up 
She said, really? She ran into the other room and grabbed the photo. Was it this guy? She said, yeah, that's him. That's Harakan Baba. He's supposedly the immortal master of India. He comes back. He's been coming into incarnation for 10,000 years. And immediately she knew that she had to go try to find this guy. And she That's came back from nine months of living with him, landed in Minneapolis. This was her first landfall. And at the Aveda Salon Studios, that Horace Reckenbacher who started Aveda has this beautiful facility in Minneapolis. She gave a lecture and there were only six or seven of us at the time. I have to tell you, Hale, it so blew my hair back at the time that every moment I spent meditating after that, I was just lit up with this universal consciousness. It was mind-blowing as this yogi materialized and dematerialized in front of her. And the story someday, someday we'll get into the full yes, story of it, yes. but it's really something. Yeah. Hale, when you when you really get that we are all of the same consciousness and yes. we are creating this world as we understand it. It has its breadth and its depth by nature of our consciousness. My teacher Swami Rama said that space is created by two thoughts held simultaneously and time is created by two thoughts sequentially. And so all time and all space, and we're three, four dimensional beings, right? We are three dimensional physical beings and fourth dimensional intellectual beings, but we bring all of this into existence. And that means that it is our privilege and our responsibility to create life as a really has always intended to be a place of heaven on earth, a place of bliss and joy and beauty and happiness and peace and mm -hmm. contentment and all of that. These are our natural states. Yes. And anything other than that, anything other than that is an invitation to open up and to recognize that as your perfect creation and to choose again how to find the true beauty, love, and peace in each moment, in each thought we think. Yeah, beautifully put. I can see why we used to have these side meetings at, during the, the TLC is because, yeah, let's talk about this. This is more interesting. <laughs> By the way, I, I knew Diane too. I knew her when she went on that trip and when she came back. Yes. That's so funny. Yeah, I fought, she, forgot all about that. When she described it, that... Um, you know, she realized that Harikam Baba dematerialized and rematerialized as eight villagers. Then she realized, well, eight and, or 800 or 8,000 or 8 billion. And so we realized that consciousness, that true awareness, the pure self is all of us. That's why it's so important when People from India greet, they place their hands together in front of their heart and say, the divinity in me sees and bows to that divinity that's within you. Mm. And what a different world we would be living in if that was our ongoing recognition of the truth of the being that is in front of each of us. And then of course, we've got challenges. For example, my son and I were on a bike ride two weekends ago, and um, somebody driving on that same highway decided that bicyclists shouldn't be on the highway. And I didn't know this was a thing, but there are people who are bicycle haters. Yes. And they will do what they can to insist that they don't occupy the same road. And we were both on the outside of the white line on a very narrow shoulder. You know, it's only about 18 inches wide before it goes to gravel. So it was out in the country. And, you know, my senses are very heightened when I'm out there because I want to stay safe physically and enjoy the countryside. And this person honked his horn very loudly and in a sustained way but only when he was exactly right next to my left ear. And um, his mirror was 
probably only about a foot off of my handlebars when he did it. And I could feel such a, a rush of, of adrenaline and cortisol. And I couldn't understand why somebody would do that. My son was ahead of me by about half a block and did the same to him. Of course, my son just flipped them the bird <laughs> and, and felt a little justified. But one of the things that we both recognized when we turned off on the next gravel road is that he had really harshed our mellow at that point. Right. <laughs> and, and I recognized the next day, it took me, yeah, maybe about five or six minutes to get past it. Ben, I could see was affected for more of an hour and a half or two. But I realized the next day what a blessing it was for me to have my encounter with that man. Because when I started studying a Forbes article on cyclist hate and um, somebody who had posted YouTube videos of hating and cursing mm -hmm. at every bicycle ride, I'm going to have to hit one of these guys. One of these, he was charged with misdemeanor for the things that he had done. But the idea was, I recognized, Hale, the suffering that that man must have endured and the abuse and hatred that must have been a part of his upbringing throughout his life. To have to be able to give outlet to something like that. Yes. So while it's fairly easy for you and me to recenter ourselves into a place of being and something that might have taken us out in the olden days for a week or a month, you know, takes us out for 30 seconds or maybe a right. minute and if a half, moment. right? Yeah, yeah. If, if that. And the idea is that not, not everybody has access to those tools and the suffering and the shame and the humiliation and the, the abuse that so many people have had to endure really leave what the yogis call samskaras, these yes. attachments to the energetic fields that we live within as a human incarnation, that pure self is surrounded by these sheaths and these sheaths of energy receive these imprints, these sorts of things, these abuses. And one of the recognitions I had from rebirthing is that virtually everyone is born into the world and experiences a post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. And we must build protection mechanisms. Of course, we know them as ego, but they're protectors. They're designed to help us survive and thrive in a world that seems to have power when we do not. Right. And since we are born in utter helplessness, it's easy to become familiar with the power that the world has and familiar with the helplessness that we perceive we have. It's true. Yeah, we start out appearing to be helpless and that imprint weaves an impression. But the other wonderful thing though, you saw this with your children, is that despite that, children are these open books. There, there, There's this innocence and openness and aliveness that you and your wife were able to not train it into your children to the best of your ability. I, Amy and I really remembered that. You're describing when you, with your children, how what you always did is do your best to not turn their lights out. Yeah. We to both run love interference. that. <laughs> right, right, right. Run interference to those who would selectively target them to de-genius the magnificence. Right, right, right. Right, right, right. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Yeah, it's, it's so true, isn't it? That we are amazingly resilient. But and, and the other thing about it, and perhaps in your journeys through this world, when you encounter someone who has had a deep wound, that became the leverage for them to realize the gift that they're here to deliver in this lifetime, their contribution. Yes, yeah, sometimes the deepest suffering sends us in a direction that really catapults us into the light. And I'm, I'm not recommending anyone listening to me, look, go look for suffering. Believe me, you don't need to look for it. <laughs> it finds you every moment. <laughs> it's close at hand. <laughs> it's close at hand. But 
if you hold your challenges as best you can, as opportunities or gifts that are going to point you to the places inside of yourself that if open to or let go of or welcomed or well, reveal joy and happiness and peace and light, reveal your basic nature. Well, and I love those words, the allow. Um, when you and I did our first audio program for learning strategies, it was called Euphoria. Yeah, I remember that, yes. And uh, basically my business partner, Pete Bissonette said, Paul, I just got an idea. Let's do a home study course on euphoria. I said, great. And here's how it's going to go. <laughs> We're going, I'm not going to do it just by myself. I have my take on it, but I want to reach out to five or six of our colleagues who teach in this sphere and ask them their take on it and what they would do to help someone. And uh, you were on the top of the list. And here's the interesting thing, Hale, of all the people that I contact, the first thing out of their mouths when I said, how would you teach someone to experience euphoria? The first thing out of everyone's mouth, including yours was, well, euphoria is our natural state. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and how I would do it is this. And of course you did Sedona method. And right, right, right. Of course, everybody, everybody had a completely different approach. I know. And they all worked. And this is, the beauty of it is when we recognize the fundamental nature of who we are, it's right there for us to see. And that's a, how Rhonda really has framed this book, The Greatest Secret. And then when you and I were going to do a paraliminal, which is my proprietary technology for human development, I said the one exercise that you do that I would love to capture on a paraliminal is triple welcoming. Yes, yes. And so your words just a moment ago just reminded me, brought me right back to the triple welcoming technique is yes. so often the thing that we fear most, we put up big walls to resist. And of course, those become the sails that catch that energy and push right, right, us right. in whatever direction they would choose. But if you drop the sails and just welcome it and let it come, it comes to pass. It yeah, just isn't here to flows stay. through. Yeah. 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 Welcoming is one of the key parts of what we do. And it's what's nice is it's natural. Everyone listening to this is welcoming in a good part of the time. What you notice is when you're not welcoming. You notice when you're resisting, when you're saying no, when you're rejecting, when you're struggling. The mind grabs onto that and ignores how much of the uh, your whole day, you're just allowing whatever happens to unfold as it does. And as you change your inner balance in the direction of allowing for that natural welcoming that's always right here, right now, it becomes a living support and a living core of what you're experiencing. And the places where you were holding on before naturally fade into the background. They get less and less important, less and less stuck, less and less a place where you lose yourself in. So it's... Yes, it's what my teacher said, where we give away our power. Yes, yes. And when we can embrace those things that are problematic for us, there is a double positive whammy that we get. Number one <laughs> is we get to reclaim the power that we're trying to give away to something outside of us and reclaim it as our own power. And then secondly, we reclaim our role as creator or in some languages, co-creator of this universe that we're living. And so that double positive whammy comes when we allow and when we welcome whatever is showing up in our experience. And, and um, this was something that happened for me, Haley. I mentioned paraliminals. When I was teaching and using as a clinical hypnotherapist a technology called hypnosis. Not a whole lot of people know what that's all about. But I was also studying yoga 
science and philosophy and was just initiated into Raja Yoga. Uh, I had been studying it for two and a half years, but in 1976, I then was initiated with a mantra from my teacher, Usharbud Arya, who became Swami Veda Bharati. And he, when I was walking on campus at the University of Minnesota, I was a biological sciences student. I was listening to a lot of audio cassettes by Nightingale Conan Corporation, yes. Earl Nightingale, yes, Leave yes. the Field, and all these other ones. I'd spent a lot of money on it and absolutely loved it, shared it with everybody that I knew sold audio cassettes as something that Leonard Orr from Rebirthing had kind of turned me on to. Yes. And um, I suddenly heard a voice that said, we don't need more cassette tapes to tell people how to live their lives. What we need is a way to bring people to that place of resourcefulness within them where the resources already exist and then help them bring those forward into their lives. And I took that on as, okay, got it. Mm -hmm. 12 years later, the incarnation called Paraliminals came about. But the idea was an important one, Hale, and it was, it was from the philosophy that you can't self-improve the self. The right. self is already <laughs> perfect just as it is. Yes, exactly. The philosophy saying that who we are is consciousness and bliss and that thou art or all that you are, who you are is this ever free, ever pure, ever wise being. And so what is there to improve? And right. it was, wait a minute, I'm in the self-improvement business. Wait, hold on. Yeah. What does it mean to be in self-improvement if there's no improving the self? And right. that awareness has guided my life, my professional life ever since. Yeah. So the, the most enduring product line of learning strategies is that paraliminal technology, which has been sold now in 185 countries. And it's, um, I get the great privilege of meeting people, some who have listened to paraliminals for 20 and 30 years and never met me personally. Right, right, right. So when we think about this natural state being euphoria, our natural state being consciousness and bliss, our natural state being ever free, ever pure, ever wise, then doesn't it behoove us in anything that is troubling us from the outside that we turn within to find the solution or the answer to the disorienting dilemma we're experiencing? Yes, it totally does. It totally does. In my experience, true transformation on any level begins from the inside out, not from the outside in. This is not my analogy, but I heard someone else talk about this. And when you're not working from source or from truth or from beingness, and you're trying to solve a problem in your life, it's like moving around deck chairs on the Titanic. You can move the, the deck chairs around, but the ship is still going down. So in, unless you're dealing with that which the icebergs in your consciousness that you're your ship of life is running into, and you're also recognizing that you're, you are the ocean, it's a forever struggle, even if you're doing all the right things. So when you, when you start to recognize that you are your ultimate resource right now, right within you, and you do things like what you do, the paraliminals and the other tools that you give out, it changes how we experience our life. And this is a, a key concept behind the work that you and I do, Hale, is very often people will be attracted to our work for the purpose of remediating something that isn't working. They're right. coming for a remedial fix. This is broken in my life. Please help me to fix it. But the technologies that we are sharing with people are by nature generative, meaning that once they have fixed this one thing using this technology, they will have become skilled to use this technology to fix other things like it and different than it. 
So the change that occurs within once you begin shifting how you make meaning of the problems that you face is key. And when you talk about the definition of transformation, you know, I did my PhD work. I remember that in, in yeah. transformational leadership. Yes. In, in transformational leadership and change. And so the definitions of transformation that are germane to what you just said, Hale, is that the fundamental shift is a change in meaning making. And that's why the book the Greatest Secret is an important piece of work from the standpoint of facilitating our transformation is because it helps a person change the meaning that they put on the experiences that they are having. And when you change your meaning making, you've changed everything. The way I like to describe it is, you know, we look at our lives and live our lives through this lens and the lens in many cases has been handed to us by our systems of education and family and culture. This is the lens of our mental model. And so everything coming through that lens is just tilted or twisted in a way that it gives us the perception that we have. And at some point in our lives, we experience an event that we can't make sense of That's right. by the lens that yes, we're yes. looking through. And that disorienting dilemma right there says, whoa, 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 wait. And now we're looking at the lens we've been looking through. And the moment you look at the lens, for example, your mind, and you look at it from the standpoint of you're not your mind, you are the awareness that mind that is using mind. Right, right. You are the awareness that is using the brain. You're the mind that that awareness that is using emotions in this human experience. You are that consciousness for whom the eyes see, for whom the ears hear, for whom this body feels. And that is what requires us to pay attention to is that awareness that precedes all of it. Of course, that's the transformational moment where we begin to question the objects and the subjects of our awareness. And um, this changes the change that changes everything. It's that shift in meaning making. Now, in studying meaning making, or what in more academic terms, it's called your epistemology. It's how you look at the world. Okay, I know that's a mouthful and yes, it is something you need to spit into a Kleenex, but the Guys idea, tight. Yeah, your epistemology is your meaning making, how you go about meaning making. And, and a couple of authors named Keegan and Leahy described three levels. The first level is the socialized mind. You are yes. just the mind that was given this lens and that's all you see is the lens you're right. looking through. And then we become self-authoring minds when we awaken to the fact that, wait, the secret says, wait a minute, exactly. you're actually, that's at the second you're level, actually yeah. making this. And so that the millions of people that made a shift from socialized mind to self-authoring mind. Wow. And that's, of course, how learning strategies started. It started yes. helping people make that transition, giving tools to help move from the socialized mind to the self-authoring mind. And what I realized that throughout my career, I've always been attracted to technologies that we're doing something other. And that's this generative change. Because what I realized that what I was most interested in is the self-transforming mind. And you see, that's the third level of transformation of human awareness is the self-transforming mind. So whatever comes in, we can have whatever perceived perception of it we choose. So that someone who is trying to run me off the road out of hate and anger becomes a gift 
to me to see the depth of my work can make a profound difference in the lives of those who are suffering. You know, it's that fast that I can turn that around. Yes. And yes. that's this ability is really what is an underlying subtext to this book and to our work, Hale, is that we're really building generative technologies for people to become the self-transforming mind. Right. That right. is awareness. Right, right. So this has been a fun conversation. I, I have a question for you. Um, is there a, a, a generative technique that you could share quickly with uh, all of us that you think people could use in this moment oh, yes. and then continue to use do you have something you'd like to share? Yes, it's, um, it's very simple. And yet the concept behind it is very deep. And I would like to give the simplicity of it and then explain the depth of it and then do it one more time because it's only about a 90 second process. Yeah, no, no, please. We, okay. that's, why, that's why I said it now to give you time to <laughs> go for it. <laughs> I okay. didn't want us to run out of time. No, I didn't get to, you didn't say anything about no, that. No, I didn't say, yeah. So the first piece of it is very simple. You take a deep breath in and as you exhale, you close your eyes and let your shoulders relax. So give it a shot. Deep breath in, gentle exhale, let your shoulders relax. And when you drop your shoulders, what you do is you create a sense of safety and become aware of yourself in this present moment where your body is in the space your body is occupying right here. The second step is to smooth out your forehead, just to relax your forehead and around your eyes, your cheeks, your jaw, and to bring a subtle hint of a smile to the corners of your lips and the corners of your eyes. And the third part is to notice the touch of the breath in the nostrils so that as you exhale and inhale, you can let the transitions between them be smooth. No pauses, no hesitations, just a smooth, continuous flow. And then if you could allow those two breaths to be of an equal duration, a similar duration, so that the length of the exhale and the length of the inhale become more even. And maintaining an awareness of the flow of this breath and the relaxation in your face and shoulders, gently open your eyes. Now this simple exercise is doing something quite profound to our neurophysiology. So we've got five parts of our brain, really. We've got the reptilian brain, and that's the freeze. You know, if you're under stress, it freezes. Mm -hmm. We've got the mammalian brain or the, the limbic system, which is the emotional brain. And that's designed to fight or flight when you're under stress. And then we've got the neocortex, the left and right hemispheres of the brain. And uh, those are designed to be balanced and to harmonize with each other. But when we're under stress, our attention, our perception, our thinking, our decision-making, our ability to respond, our memory, they're all negatively impacted by cognitive stress. So the access to the real powerhouse of our brain can't be gained. And that's the prefrontal cortex, the place that enlarges when we meditate. It's the part that has the God spot in it. It's the part of us that sees the big picture and can have visions of hope for a future possibility. That's important. But when we're under stress, we downregulate. And so this process has three parts. The first, which is to take a breath, exhale, that deals with the reptilian brain. It's the most ancient part of us. And the relaxing of the shoulders says you're safe. Because when you're under stress, what happens? Yes, right? You naturally your, stick your shoulders sh in your ears. <laughs> your shoulders come right up around <laughs> right. your head. So yeah, I'm wearing my shoulders for earrings today. Uh, and, that's and right. So when you just, that simple act instantly affects that most ancient part of the brain. 
The second part is relaxing the forehead. And you know, all the biofeedback studies started with the frontalis muscle. Yes, yes. They, they, they put an electromyograph, their... right? Yes. And so that's associated with relaxation all over the body. But then when you get that hint of a smile, there's a lot of research that says when you smile, there's a neurochemistry that emerges. And you know, our friend Shani likes to say about smile. Yes. Start my internal love engine. <laughs> so, ah, I don't re didn't remember that. Yeah, and but Chenyi has some amazing gems. <laughs> yes, and so this is the place of our heart, right? So when we belong, when we feel that we're in a community where we belong, there is a calm that emerges at that moment. And it was deadly historically. If we got kicked to the curb by our tribe, it was not likely that we would survive. So feeling like we belong is important and opening the heart in this way with this smile and with this relaxation of your face triggers that positive neurochemical response in the midbrain. And then the breath, and this is a perfect analogy of duality, right? The exhale is wonderful, but it's not sustainable. So at some point you're going to have to inhale and the inhale is <laughs> lovely, but it's not sustainable. At right, some right, point right. you got to let it go. And so this polarity map of the breath also maps across the hemispheres of the brain across our nervous system, the extensor and flexor muscle groups, the sympathetic and parasympathetic. So just to get that breath and an awareness of it in your nostrils brings you to the present moment here and now. You can't be somewhere else and be aware of your breath, by the way. Right, right. That's you, why so many, the, so many teachings focus on breath awareness. Always, yeah. always, yeah. always, always. So so you see in 90 seconds or less, you can upregulate the brain so that the reptilian, the limbic, the neocortex are all in a place where now you can see I have efficacy, I have agency, I can do some small next step. And so this is when we wanna bring into mind, where are you going today? What do you want for today? And when you have that vision in your mind, you're lighting up that prefrontal cortex, which is the place where our creative imagination, our creative power really resides. So can I lead this one more time? So oh, please. Yes. No, absolutely. Okay. So I, was, I was waiting on the edge of my seat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I, I think it's a really good idea for us to do it again, because okay. it will also, all of us will be able to remember it more. And yes. it will integrate more within us as we hear it again. So let's Good. do it. Here we go. So take a deep breath in. And as you gently exhale, simply close your eyes and let your shoulders relax. And at this moment, becoming aware of the space your body is occupying, you recognize you're safe. Now notice the muscles of your forehead and imagine they could smooth out and that that relaxation could spread across the muscles of your eyes, your cheeks, your jaw, and bring a very slight hint of a smile to the corners of your eyes and the corners of your mouth. And in this recognizing the deeper peace, the calm that is your natural state, you belong here. This is a community that supports you. And finally, notice the movement of the breath specifically. Become aware of the feeling of it, the touch of it in your nostrils. Because as you do that, feeling the exhale and inhale, you come into this present moment where all of your resources as a mature human being exist. And as you allow the breath to flow in a continuous manner, no hesitations or pauses to lock in an emotion or a thought, but just let it flow. And finally, allowing the exhale and inhale to be of a similar duration so that there is a balance and this balance is a balance between the hemispheres of the brain, between the body and mind, between the spiritual and the human experience, between 
the sympathetic outwardly oriented action nervous system and the parasympathetic, which is the healing, restoring, regenerative nervous system. And then at a rate that's right for you, bring into mind how you want the rest of this day to go and how you want to show up, perhaps a bit more joyful, peaceful, contented, grateful, happy. And when you're ready, simply return by opening your eyes, maintaining a sense of that touch of the breath and the relaxation in your face and shoulders. So what my teacher Swami Veda said was, forget about all the yogic practices that you did for so many years, 30, 35 years ago. And he said, just find a few minutes during the day to drop into this place of silence. And that's available to all of us. That is re-emerging ourselves into that field of awareness that we are. So easy, just do that and you'll be fine. <laughs> that's perfect. What a perfect place to wrap it up. And with that reminder to just let yourself pause and be what you are. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Paul Shuey. He and I have been friends for decades, and I'm so happy we're able to share this time with you today. If you'd like to experience Paul's programs, I encourage you to visit a special page he set up for us. Go to learningstrategies.com forward slash free hail. That's www.learningstrategies.com forward slash free hail. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe so you have immediate access to future episodes. Please give us a five-star rating and share it with the people you care about. If you'd like to learn more about my work, my mentor, Lester Levinson's work, and the Sedona Method, please visit www.sedona.com. As you explore our site, you'll learn the key to lasting happiness, success, peace, and emotional well-being. We have books, courses, events, and plenty of free material to explore. Again, go to sedona.com. That's S-E-D-O-N-A.com. Thank you for being here. And we'll catch you on the next episode of Letting Go and the Greatest Secret.